Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, continuing on with our exploration of the four properties of an ism. Before we delve into that, let's just talk very briefly about what an ism is. An ism is neither a harf, which is a small word that has an impact on the meaning or context of a word that comes after it, nor is it a fa'id, uh, which is essentially an action word. An ism then is a supernoun which is a person, place, thing, adjective, or adverb, etc. Anything, in essence, that is not a harf, nor a fa'il. Now, when it comes to an ism, there are four properties. Just as a quick review, the first that we covered was definiteness, which is dealing with whether or not a word is specific or non-specific. So is it referring to something known or something in general? The apple versus a apple. Now, we also spoke about gender, which is the second property. We said by default, all isms are masculine unless there are eight particular signs that make them feminine. The third was number, and we said that an ism can be singular, meaning it refers to one entity. It can be dual, meaning it refers to two entities. Two entities. It could be plural sound, which means that it has the original singular form of the word still intact and there's something just added on to the end so going from muslim to muslimuna see how that una was added on to the end that would be an example of sound plural or it could be a broken plural where the singular version of the word has actually been altered and changed and an example of that would be something such as the word qalamun when you take the word qalamun and you make it plural it becomes aqlam see how with aqlam the hamza is added to the beginning and on the lam an alif is added so something is inserted into the word itself or something is taken away there's some type of change that is occurring in english an example of this would be such as um mouse and then the plural of it being mice the word is completely different there's a change that's occurred and the fourth is status and that is essentially when an ism has on its the it is essentially determining the purpose of an ism based on its ending. And we're going to further explore this property once uh, again today, and we're going to look at a, a deeper layer of it, which is flexibility. So what exactly is flexibility? So if you remember back to our Muslim chart, we had Muslimun, Musliman, and Muslimin. This is an example of fully flexible, meaning that for each one of the states, whether it be Rafa, Nasb, or Jar, they can be indicated to by a particular sign. So for Rafa, it's indicated by Dhamma. For Nasb, it's indicated by Fatha. And by Jar, it's indicated by Kasra. It's able to be fully represented by its particular diacritical mark that is associated to it. That is fully flexible. So what is non-flexible then? So non-flexible is the opposite of fully flexible, meaning that for every single state, it's going to look the exact same. It's not going to bend to take its appropriate diacritical mark. So whether it's rafa, it's hadha. Whether it's nasab, it's hadha. Whether it's jar, it's hadha. They all look the same. And telling the difference between them is actually going to come by knowing their context. Right? So what's happening around the world, the word itself to give us an understanding of what state it's actually in. Another example would be the pronoun huwa, which means he. So in rafa, it's huwa. In nasab, it's hua, and in jar, it's hua. Regardless of whatever state it's in, that ending is always going to be fixed to being a fatha, right? Because it's non flexible. So we're only going to really know its true state based on the context that it's in and the way that it's being utilized. So there are four types of words that are non flexible, and we'll study these in detail as they come along. So the tricky one is partially flexible. So there are three types of flexibilities there's fully flexible, meaning it will take lamma. Nasab, uh, sorry, uh, Lamma, Fatha, and Kasra to show its respective states. Then there's non flexible, where it's always going to look the same throughout every single state. Then there's partially flexible. So, what does partially flexible mean? Partially flexible means that it will not take a tenween. So, you'll never see it have a double ending like um, Aswadun, nor will it take Kasra. So, let's just take a quick look at this. So, as we said uh, previously, Partially flexible words will never have a double ending or tenween. So the word aswadun cannot have a double ending. It just can't. It cannot have that tenween. 
it would actually have to be aswadu, nor can it have kasra. So it would never be aswadi, it would actually be aswada. Let's take a look at it. So we have aswadu as rafa, and we have aswada as the nasab, and we have aswada once again as the jar. So in both nasab and jar, it looks the same. It's represented by a fatha because it's partially flexible. It can't fully bend to take on that kasra of the jar state. It's kind of being stopped midway. Now, when does partially flexibility what one does partial flexibility apply? It applies in seven circumstances, and one of them is to the names of colors, right? So aswad means black, right? If it was, let's say, um, red, it would be ahmaru, ahmara, ahmara. See, once again, unable to take tanween, nor take the kasra when it's in the jar state. This is actually quite similar to the dual. When you deal with the dual, um, it is muslimaini for the nasb, and it's muslimaini, once again, for the jar. You'd have to look at the context to figure out what state it's actually in. This is the same that's being applied to the partially flexible. Another instance of partially flexible is the name of a place. So it would be makkatu, makkata, makkata. Not able to take kasra, nor able to take tanween. The third instance is a female name. So fatimatu. Fatimata in nasb and fatimata in jar, unable to take tanween nor able to take kasra. The fourth case would be a non Arab name such as Yusuf, right? That's not an Arabic name, it is derived from another language. So Yusufu, Yusufa, Yusufa, one in jar, no tanween nor kasra. The fifth instance would be a comparative noun, and a comparative noun is essentially when you're taking a noun and you put it on the pattern of af'alu, this makes it comparative or superlative. So when you take the word kabara, which means to be big, and you put it on the pattern of akbaru, it means either greater than, so it's being compared to something, or greatest, right? So it means greater or greatest. So akbaru, akbara, akbara. The sixth is broken plurals with alifs in the middle. And the example that we gave is, let's say you take masjid, which is singular. When you make it plural, it takes an alif in the middle, this purple indication right here. So it becomes masajidu, masajida, masajida. It will never be masajidi. The final instance of partially flexible are body defects. So we have a'raju, a'raja, a'raja. And that's something that you'd have to just know through the meaning of the word itself. So just a quick summary of the partially flexible words. We have four of them that deal with names. So names of places, female names, names of colors, and non-Arab names. Then we have ones that deal with the actual forms of the word. So comparative nouns, which are usually on the pattern of af'alu. Then we have broken plurals with an alif in the middle. And then finally, we have one based on meaning, which is the bodily defect. And this is just a quick summary of partially flexible, fully flexible, and non-flexible words. This discussion can actually get a lot more deeper when it comes to partially flexible isms. And this is something that we'll study in more detail as time goes on, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.